give me a sense here of why there wasn't more security for an event that was essentially billed to a large extent as a revolution, as an overthrow of the government? It's indefensible. I mean, this is not a case where you're dealing with something that came with no warning or there was no intelligence. If you open the newspaper over the last week, you saw they were boasting about coming to Washington, to use the president's word, going wild, bringing guns, uh, using revolutionary rhetoric. It was perfectly obvious, given what was going to be scheduled for the Capitol, that was going to be the epicenter of the focus. So what any rational, competent security leader would do is assess, OK, what is the worst case scenario? What personnel do we need? What capabilities do we need? And how large a perimeter should we have? And you put that in place in advance. Proper barricades, an extended perimeter, and reinforcements from other federal agencies or the National Guard positioned in advance. It seems that this was not done. And they were undermanned and didn't have the right equipment or sufficient quantities of the right equipment and waited until after the Capitol had been breached to call for help. And to me, that is the, a, a primary dereliction of duty. Since 9-11, there's been a lot of effort and money invested in securing the Capitol because that was a target on 9-11. Hmm. And the idea that we couldn't secure it against domestic terror is shocking. Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, President-elect Joe Biden calls this an act of domestic terrorism. Michael, therefore, how do we prepare ourselves for the all-important next date, January 20th, the inauguration? <clears throat> well, actually, the inauguration in many ways is easier because, um, partly because of the virus, you don't need to have or want to have necessarily a big ceremony. And they can adjust where and how the oath is taken, depending on the security situation. Plus, the Secret Service will be managing the security for the president then. And usually, an inauguration is made what they call a national special security event, where they get additional resources from other agencies. <clears throat> so I think that they'll be prepared for the inauguration. I think the longer term issue is some portion of the people whom we saw yesterday are going to continue to be agitating out there. We don't know to what extent Donald Trump, when he leaves office, is going to be using rhetoric that encourages more violence. We saw attacks on state capitals yesterday, as well as on the federal capital. So I think domestic terrorism, as President-elect Biden said, is exactly right. We're going to face an uptick in that. And in many ways, it's now supplanted global jihadism as the biggest terror threat we face in the U.S. Given the backdrop of those comments, do you and how do you hold social media accountable if you think that they had a role to play? Well, first of all, I gather Facebook's taken uh, Donald Trump off of Facebook or they've you know, suspended his account. Um, part of the issue to remember is a lot of the communication occurred not on the mainstream social media platforms, but on uh, platforms that are less well-known and less accessible, except to those who are initiated, like a Parler or 8chan or 4chan. Also, frankly, a lot of it is openly said in the, in the regular media. People will talk about what they're doing. They're walking around, uh, you know, with flags and images that suggest violence. So this is not a case where surreptitiously social media was helping hatch plans. Basically, anybody who had their eyes open could hear the president of the United States invite people to come and create mayhem during the electoral vote count on January 6th. I am curious, Michael. I mean, every now and then I, I'll go to some of those sites you mentioned just out of curiosity to see what folks are talking about. I'm wondering, how much does law enforcement monitor those sites? I'm talking like 4chan, 8chan, 8kun, those types of sites. And how much, and how seriously do they take some of the rhetoric uh, that's uh, bandied about on those websites? I, I think they do monitor it. There are legitimate constraints based on First Amendment issues about not just scooping up everything that's out there and looking at it. Um, so they need some predication. But I do think one of the issues we need to consider is whether we need to maybe give them a little bit more flexibility. And we always get into this kind of push-pull. On the one hand, there are legitimate concerns about not having the government conduct surveillance, 
We certainly don't want to be like China. On the other hand, when people get online and talk about exploding bombs or killing people, and then afterwards you go to the law enforcement, law enforcement authorities and you say, why didn't you know that? That creates a, a real question. So I think we need to take a look at how do we balance uh, legitimate surveillance to protect lives against illegitimate surveillance. And I, I'll be honest and say it's a tough uh, set of legal issues.